Getting it real with Wong Chun Wai on the hottest topics, frank, engaging, and candid. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Good evening, Malaysia and followers from around the world. The G15 has just been concluded, and I believe that many Malaysians uh, would have stayed until this morning to follow the results. And the results are just still coming in. Uh, many of us still have uh, reservations over some of the figures that has been reported by the press. Even those in the press are not too sure which is actually the actual number. Uh, but um, it has thrown out a lot of surprises for me, uh, in particularly uh, the performance by PASS. It's a uh, hangaman as predicted by most of us. Uh, but what does it mean? And that um, joining us tonight is uh, Dr. Trisha Yeo, the uh, CEO of the Institute of Democracy and Economic Affairs. Welcome, Dr. Trisha. Hi, hi, good evening to everyone here. I think uh, it's been a long two days, uh, nights as well. So yeah. Um, yeah, hopefully we will be able to resolve the hung parliament situation very soon um, and actually see an actual government forming in the next couple of days. I think it'll be faster than that, Dr. Trisha. But uh, let's uh, go on to the uh, main issue. What has been your general response and your general reaction to the results that we have received now? Um, to be honest, it wasn't so much of a surprise uh, because mm -hmm. before going into the election, I actually sure. expected that uh, number one, PH would have the largest number of seats, which has happened as a coalition, as a single coalition. Uh, however, insufficient to actually form governments, right? With a simple majority. Yes. So that much has happened. Number two, um, I also expected that there would be movements towards what we are already seeing now. Uh, I think as we speak, the negotiations are underway for a PNBN government to form together with the East Malaysian counterparts of GPS and GRS. So those two things were at least um, not too surprising for me. Uh, what was surprising, of course, was the extent to which PN just got the sweep of three state governments, you know, all Perlis, yeah. Pahang and Perak. Of course, Perak by only a slim margin of two seats, but they basically swept all the three states. Um, and of course, PN has also done tremendously well. I mean, far exceeding our expectations. Um, yeah. And of course, within PN, the lion's shareholder of that would be PAS. So I think that is probably going to be the mainstay of many people discussing themes, um, in the next weeks, months to come. Essentially, you know, what does pass, what does the the return in such a powerful manner, uh, the first time actually for, for pass yeah. to, to as a single party, hold the, the largest number of seats, right? Uh, yeah. 49 seats out of the 222. So what does this mean for the country moving forward? I think there are a lot of things to unpack there. Uh, I also mm. think that the non-Malay communities, uh, this is also a real opportunity for us to do some introspection and think about uh, what kind of society it is that we will eventually live in and, and, and what country it is that our our future generations will have. Mm -hmm. Krisha, uh, the reality is that uh, more than 95%, I think, um, of Chinese uh, voted for Pakatan Harapan. The Chinese voters actually believe that the Pakatan Harapan would form the government. Although most of the analysts know that uh, while, as you said, that the uh, PH will get the lion's share or the most seats, but it could not, it would never reach 112. But many Chinese actually believe that would happen and that uh, they see the, uh, they saw the uh, huge uh, mega churamas in the West Coast, uh, but many did not see uh, the uh, the, the sentiments of we could not know the sentiments of the Malay heartland. And in this case, in GE15, it was not just the rural Malay who voted for PAS, and, and, uh, but in fact, that in the places like uh, Permatang Pau, Kepala uh, Batas, uh, PN did very well, PAS did very well, and they voted for uh, PN, and most of it uh, passed. Um, why do you think in this case, even the posters got it wrong? They gave very high numbers to uh, PH. Why did the numbers got it wrong? And why was it that uh, we did not pay too much attention to PN? In fact, uh, at the beginning of uh, most of the post surveys uh, dated October 28, they wrote off and written off uh, past. Why 
did that happen? Okay, so I think um, the posters actually were not very far off as far as PH was concerned because if you look at the consensus across the board about you know three or four different polling agencies that I was looking at, um, they gave an estimate of yeah between 87 and 99 seats. So uh, it's still you know 80s to 90s around that region. Um, and that's not very far off, right, from what PH eventually achieved at, uh, what was it, 80, 82, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, so that's not very far off. I think uh, where you are correct is that they did get the mark off for the BNPN. So there were a lot more seats allocated to BN um, than PN, whereas in reality, it was the other way around. Uh, so honestly, I mean, this is BN's poorest showing in history. Yes. Uh, the last election was already poor for them at over 50 seats, now at 30 seats. It really is the poorest showing. So, um, you know, if you talk about introspection, that's certainly something that BN really needs to do something about moving forward. I mean, yes, President Zahid Hamidi won by only by scraping through with a mere 300 over vote margin. Um, Ismail Sabri did better. With, uh, he had a better margin than the last election. So that's something um, to look at, but BN, yeah, we'll, we'll need to think about its own internal transformation and also seeing as its big wig um, candidates that a lot of people put a lot of capital in, uh, people like Khairi and Tengu Zafrul mm -hmm. having lost their seats as well. Uh, but coming to PN, I think your question about why is it that so many people did not see this coming. Um, I think in the last few weeks of the polling, you, there were actually indications, even though they didn't attribute the number of seats. So for example, if you look at um, the Merdeka Centre poll, the most recent one that came out, I think only on Friday night, or was it like the, the one before that, um, it was Perikatan National that gained about 12 percentage points in terms of popularity over the last month alone, which means that even though they started out as the underdog, they were the ones who progressed the fastest in the last couple of weeks. And uh, I think we can really, you know, let, let's unpack that as well, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. uh, PN did a tremendous job in TikTok. Yeah. We know that for mm -hmm. this election, the, the Undi 18, the automatic voter registration among the young, visibility mm -hmm. on social media and which social media, right? It yeah. was actually TikTok and they spent a lot of money on it, right. Um, you know, ad spending revenue, not not revenue, uh, expenditure, yeah. sorry, right. by PN was really high. So mm. PN did that messaging very well, uh, very strongly, very clearly. And and I think just one last point before I, um, I miss my thought is that they also championed this whole anti-corruption, right? So the governor right. anti-corruption drive. And they successfully pitched themselves as the alternative to BN. And okay. so for an, a large electorate for whom BN was no longer an acceptable option because the figure of Zahid's, uh, you know, yes. his popularity just plummeted all the way down to 1%, right? Just before the election. Yes. Um, mm. He is the leader of the party. I think he just was not palatable any longer. So the natural option, not a corrupt BN coalition, not mm. quite willing to vote for a PH because of these various real mm. or imagined grievances yeah. that they have with DAP uh, working within PH. Mm. So the natural option was to go for PN. Uh, I think, you know, time will tell um, mm. how much of it was, a, was an anti-BN vote and how much of it was a pro-pass pro yes. say conservative vote. I mean, there are distinctions right. there and I think we need to be careful in how we distinguish those slight differences. This election, I went around to many parts of the uh, country. Uh, this is the first election where the president of uh, Barista National or AMNO, where many of the BN candidates uh, quietly says that do not use the posters of uh, Zaid Habidi, that he was a liability. And all of them tried not to use his uh, posters. And in many cases, some of the um, candidates went around to say that, okay, you do not want to vote for AMNO or Barista National, but please vote me as an individual candidate. So it boils down to that, that uh, Zahid was a liability. Now, and of course, the narrative by Perikatan National against BN that the BN represents uh, corruption, it worked very well. I also want to talk about only 18. Um, how did the preliminary uh, assessment, how did the young voters actually vote? Because... 
uh, the perception was that, oh, these young voters would flock to uh, uh, PH, but it doesn't seem to go that way. Uh, from our assessment, it seems to show that there are many of the young Malay voters felt that, look, uh, uh, we, we seems to be the, the franchise uh, group, you know, we have not benefited from uh, from AMNO, corrupt, you know, uh, as you say that we cannot quite give it to uh, uh, to uh, to uh, to PH because that it is uh, it is associated with uh, the AP. You look at the result of uh, Anwar Ibrahim. Uh, Teja actually gave him a big fight, and at some point we thought that actually Anwar had lost. Okay, and in Moa, side City just won narrowly. Do you think that in these areas, these two seats are predominantly Malay? Do you think that the young voters felt that look? Um, uh, this is not the kind of uh, politics that we really want. Uh, PH uh, politicians who speak about multiculturalism. Uh, but for us, we want a clean government. But at the same time, I embrace the conservative Islamic values. And these leaders do not quite reflect what I want. Am I correct in this assessment? So um, I think uh, a few things there, right? So number one, the assumption that the young would vote for PH and the young would be of a more um, multiracial inclusive mindset, I think is a fallacy that we in the urban English speaking type areas yeah. really need to rid ourselves of. Um, mm -hmm. we, we really, that, that that is a false narrative that yeah. we just cannot, you know, continue yeah. to convince ourselves about anymore. Um, mm -hmm. Number two, what I think we need to also start to come to terms with is to grapple with the realities that the large majority of Malaysia, young or old, um, actually is, is, is the, the, the terms are so difficult now because yeah. you, know, you can't, don't, don't use, if I say the, the term conservative, a certain mm. image pops into your mind, but yeah. let's say traditional, okay? okay? So a large majority of Malaysia, um, especially Malay Malaysia, is mm -hmm. traditional. So they hold on to these traditional values. Um, I, I see, I'm hesitant to say the word conservative, right? Because I think okay. those are, there are some perceptions sure. that naturally come into our minds. But um, there is this very real fear and I think we haven't done enough to allay those fears as the non-Malay community. I mean, there may be debates around this, um, that their identities are in question. So, mm. and I, I'm speaking as somebody who sure. evidently, you know, embraces a liberal democracy mm. and so on, but maybe the language that has been used somehow has escaped us um, to be able to identify with, with those mm. traditional conservative values. And... I don't know. I, I just think it's the right time for us to reconsider what narrative it is that we want to use when we talk about our multiracial Malaysia. Um, yeah. This large majority of, let's say, traditionalists, they they wouldn't necessarily feel that infringing mm. on our rights is the right thing to do. They would be happy to live with us, right? It's yeah. just... Um, yeah, I think... I think sure. I don't I don't even know how to, to begin yeah. to articulate it any longer, but what I'm saying is that maybe using the yeah. language of international human rights and the standards yeah. of the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. Yeah. I mean, look, believe me, I believe in all those things, but can we say it in terms that are more understandable to them, right? That yeah. are actually based on belief systems and values and principles that they hold on to dearly. Um mm -hmm. You know, friends of mine long time ago already have used, for example, Quranic teachings to talk about human yeah. rights. Maybe that's something that we need to learn a bit more of. Sure. Yeah, I don't yeah. have all the answers, but I mean, I think that's what I'm just saying that just take sure. a hard look at, you know, what, what the nature of the Malaysian population sure. is like. Yeah. Uh, you, you spoke about uh, our sort of like a, a um, stereotype uh, projection of uh, parties like past uh, from the election results. We're talking about in GE uh, 14, they won around 18 seats. Now it's 40 over and still counting. Uh, they, they have gained tremendously. They'll probably be the military person of uh, police for sure and probably other states. Okay. Now, um, so to the perception of uh, urbanites, the Bangsa bubble is like uh, because of the way the past leaders dress themselves. Okay. 
in their Juba and Kopia, we, we have this projection that, oh, they must be a, a pretty rural, uh, not, not very urban. But the result shows that they're actually very structured, very polished, and they actually got their act together. If not, they wouldn't be able to deliver these fantastic numbers. Um, you have talked about the uh, some of the common values uh, well, uh, no, right. Do you think that um, for past, because they have projection uh, issue, now um, the fact is that they are going to play a big part in government, whoever is in charge, okay? They have a big voice. Nobody can form any government without them, okay? Um, they might even hold some of the important positions. Obviously, that uh, the reality is that the Malaysia is multiracial, multi-religious. Um, for a party like PAS, uh, we should probably have uh, many professionals as well. Uh, not just the theologians. Um, if we have deal with some of the people who have gone on to Amana, uh, same people they were in the past, uh, what do we think that they can do to give some form of reassurance to Malaysians, especially non-Muslims that look, Malaysia is not turning to the Afghanistan. What, what, how do you think they should do it? Yeah, okay. I mean, I think before I get there, I must also acknowledge that the election campaign was not completely absolved of this sort of racially and religious changed language. So we did see instances where leadership of political parties um, mm -hmm. did use race and religion in a negative way, and that's dangerous, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think that borders on, I mean, even sedition. And I think we yeah. need to be really careful if we are yeah. treading down that path. So, so that aside as a caveat, um, yes, past has been tremendously organized over the many, many years, I think it's really worth the time reading up about past history. Uh, mm -hmm. Farish Noor has a brilliant yeah. anthology of books from the 90s. And uh, to understand where past came from, past is a party that has gone through its own rounds of transformation from being ultra conservative to being open to all, this is during the Pakatan Rakyat days, and then it's mm -hmm. gone back and forth, right? So it's gone through many cycles. Um, the past that we see today is the past of, of conservatism. However, mm -hmm. there are exceptions, right? So um, if you look at the, the Trunganu Menteri Besar, for example, mm. he's a past Menteri Besar, Trunganu is a, is a past uh, state government. Um, he is a very professional, forward-looking individual mm -hmm. and in fact believes in a lot of governance and institutional reforms that we like to espouse. So I'll give yeah. you a concrete example. Ideas mm -hmm. actually did for the first time something called the Malaysian Open Budget Index where we mm -hmm. compared the transparency levels of all state government budgets across the country. So all mm -hmm. states, right? Uh, yeah. And this, you know, we look at, you know, whether the, the budget is, is transparently published online, um, do they make the data available? You know, is it easy for people to download, to access and so on? And guess which state of the 13 came out at the top? It wasn't Selangor, it wasn't Penang, it was Trunganu. I see. So I think it's just interesting to see that we have to also try and, try and cut out yeah, sure. internal personal biases, right? And yeah. acknowledge that there are um, things to look forward to. PASS mm -hmm. certainly believes in anti-corruption. Um, and yeah. I think it is it is really time for us to, to understand uh, how they tick, how they work. Um, also, for them to get to know us. Yeah. I mean, like it or not, they are in government and in, mm -hmm. in federal government, they will also find themselves having to take somewhat of a more Malaysian approach. And the final mm -hmm. thought here is um, taking a page out of Kelantan, right? So just yes. kind of curiously investigating the treatment of non-Muslims in that particular state. And I think you will find that actually um, there's not so much yeah. to be fearful about. Uh, so I think, it, yeah, it is time to, you, you, yeah. you can't help it, like you said. I yeah, mean, yeah, whatever yeah. it is, they form about, and they're here to stay, by the way. Yeah. And uh, Tricia, let's not forget that uh, DAP and the uh, past has, they had worked together. And we have seen enough pictures of uh, DAP leaders hugging and kissing Hadi Right, right. And, 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 and yeah, waving yeah. the past flag. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, of course, we had we had uh, the uh, past uh, Menteri Besar in Perak, uh, Nijar, right? Okay. Nijar, yeah. So, uh, I mean, that's in politics that uh, it's a matter of changing your clothes, okay? And what, what you wear. I want to move on a bit to uh, Sabah and Sarawak, in particular Sarawak. Uh, before the 
the polling uh, started, uh, they sent a very powerful video that look uh, to send for Sarawak, Sarawak rights. Okay, uh, they did very well. So, so do you think that uh, it's now payback time? They will demand more than just a pound of flesh to anyone. They have said that there are many suitors. Everybody wants us. We must right. be very beautiful. So I'm. I believe that uh, Arnold have lined up to call uh, Abanjo. Everybody has called, and we have this picture of uh, Mohidin and Hadi sitting down talking to uh, Abanjo. Um. So what do you think that uh, Sarawak will demand? Sure, sure. So um, Sarawak, as we know, GPS represented yeah. by Abanjo has won twenty two seats. And uh, 22 seats is a large number for any of the parties now trying to form. <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, every bit counts, but 22 is a lot. Yeah. Uh, so I think even before going into the election, um, mm -hmm. already the Ismail Sabri government had signed a sort of agreement. I saw this with both Sabah and Sarawak stating that mm -hmm. they would increase the number of seats allocated to Sabah and Sarawak yeah. above and beyond like what they already have, right? So the yeah. allocation of actual parliamentary seats at the next delineation uh, mm -hmm. will be even beyond will be beyond the number that they already have. So that's one. Uh, number two, of course, concessions, right? Uh, all sorts of concessions, positions, uh, deputy prime ministership, uh, numbers of ministers. And of course, MA63 is always first and foremost on the minds of Sabah and Sarawakians because that's also yeah. what the, the voters there demand. So um, there will be more demands, I think, of MA63. I mean, the oil and gas issue is already passed because they, they, they actually got what they wanted. They got the sales tax to be paid to Sabah and Sarawak, uh, the 5%. Uh, sales tax and then they also got um, the the kind of green light from Petronas to be able to set up their own uh, oil yeah. and gas companies right so all of that has already been happening right like right. Over, over the last couple of years um, so I think that these concessions will only grow but uh, we have also this morning ideas issued a statement sort of yeah. cautioning um, the smaller parties and coalitions Yes, they are kingmakers, we know that, but I think they also need to exercise wisdom in their roles right. and the power yeah. that they have, that they possess right now. Uh, yeah. So hopefully it's premised not so much on money politics and position distribution, which we know it will happen, but hopefully it will also include things like policy, right? So yeah. MA63 is a good example, uh, but what I would yeah. like to see not just MA63 being negotiated, possibly decentralization, of all mm. other states in the peninsula, right? Why not, you know, just yeah. Sabah and Sarawak? How about the other states? Also, things like, of course, all the institutional reforms that, you know, we champion political financing, equal constituency development funds and all those things. Um, still a far stretch, but, you, mm. you know, one can hope. <laughs> what about Sabah? Um, Warisan, uh, a lot of people expected them to perform better than what they have done. I think it's just two seats odd, okay? Uh, why do you think that... Um, Shafi did not quite deliver uh, like uh, Abang Joe. Um, well, the thing about states is that whenever there is an inclination towards a, a particular ruling coalition, basically the mm -hmm. incumbent, yeah. um, that's where the votes eventually swing towards yeah. simply because there is very little incentive for you to vote against the sway of the ruling coalition. Um, no incentives in the form of developments, no incentives in the form of grants, uh, projects that will be given to the state. And I think Sabah of all states is very cognizant of this. And they, um, well, I mean, the incumbent government there is GRS, which already yeah. contains the, yeah. the PNs and BNs of... Yeah. You know of of the Malaysian makeup, so yeah. I mean Warisan's strength has abated uh, somewhat. I mean its peak yeah. was really at twenty eighteen at the same time as Pakatan Harapan's peak. So I think it's a, a similar trajectory yeah. if one were to analyze it that way. So given that the uh, assuming assuming okay assuming that uh, Mohidin uh, Yassin will be the prime minister, uh, he has got to accommodate all these um, various interests, the packing order. You have the Sapati Basatu, and you have pass to take care of. And then if assume if assuming that the GPS and GRS part of them, so has got many demands to be made. Uh, Barusan looks like uh is down the line. 
Um, how do you think that uh, he's going to share all these rewards? Okay, are we going to see another bloated government? You know, uh, some will even say that is there any place uh, for not non the Buimpo trust and non Malays in the cabinet? Uh, do we have a place? What what's your take on that kind of argument? Um, again, you know, it's similar to what Ismail Sabri was forced to do. So yeah. under the the Ismail Sabri administration, which was dissolved. Um, he too had to accommodate a lot of demands and expectations from the partners, right? So in his case, it was a PNBN government. Um, and although he, yes, he had the support from opposition via the MOU, but he also had to distribute so many. And it was the largest cabinet ever. Um, it was also the largest in terms of political appointments on the boards of federal statutory bodies. And we know this because we tracked it on our pantaukwasa.com website. Yeah, yeah. Um, We'll probably see the same thing uh, under Tan Sri Muhyiddin. And mm. unfortunately, it's just something that Malaysia has not learned its lesson from. Yep. A large cabinet also means a lot more expenditure. Yep. Um, and I think given our debt situation, yep. it's not a healthy thing to depend on in the long run. Um, yeah. So I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. Yeah. But I do hope that they see the light uh, yeah. earlier rather than later uh, yeah. simply because you know we just cannot afford such yeah. bloated cabinet any longer in the past uh, both of us could remember the names of our cabinet ministers now I I, have, I had problem in G14 I, after that I could not quite remember who, uh, who were ministers yeah, you need to and on the, the, wall. The, the, the deputy ministers was worse yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. and uh, then we had useless uh, special envoys which many of us don't know what would be the KPI if there's if there was any. So we may have uh, this situation all over again now. But uh, just for discussion's sake, I know this is a wild card. Okay, uh, this is very strange. Uh, this is a very strange uh, G15. We started the election with many of the uh, uh, PH campaigning drastically and strongly against Barisan National. That is a corrupt government. Zahid should go to jail. And then this whole morning, I had many strange calls. Okay from Pakatan Harapan supporters and said, hey, you know what? is there a possibility, huh? is there a possibility of Anwar Ibrahim getting Zahid on board? We need Zahid to be on board to stop the Taliban. Okay, so I was flooded with all these calls. Is, there, is this uh, even possible? What's your take? Uh, I'm sure attempts have been made yeah. and overtures, you know, done. Um, all these negotiations would have started happening from yesterday already and probably are still happening uh, now, I mean, unless we, we see a swearing in that's taking place much sooner than we expect. Um, I don't think ultimately that that's going to work uh, simply because it's been the case and especially so in this election that DAP as a party has always been referred to as the bogeyman. And again, I don't see that changing anytime soon. Um uh, mm -hmm. And again, I'm not sure if I have said this already in the previous show. Yeah. It's one number one is DAP, number two is Anwar actually, because yeah. ultimately the negotiation is not just about concessions, but it's about who becomes the prime minister. Yes. And Correct. I don't think that there can be an agreement on that front. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, that would be a surprise result, yeah. but that's not something that I'm expecting to see unfolding in the next yeah. few hours. Now, um, the G15 uh, is over. The positions are going to have to sort out the arrangements to form the government. Um, but uh, six months down the line, it looks like we're going to have to go through all this again uh, with the state elections. Um, does the results of G15, do they have any ramifications of how the, uh, the, how the state elections would turn out to be? Yeah, I mean, definitely yes, because uh, as I mentioned earlier, incumbency in this in this country is really important, very powerful. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. whoever forms federal government, uh, they mm -hmm. will have the resources available, right? To yeah. go in full swing in targeting these six states. So for if the outcomes are what I expect it to be, and if it is a PNBN form of a government, then we're looking at more intense rivalries, especially within the states of Selangor, Penang, and Negeri Sembilan. So Kelantan, Kedah, and Terengganu, never mind those because we know what's going to happen there. Yeah. Um, already past dominates, and that will continue to take place within those three states. If anything, probably sweep even more 
seats than they already currently hold. Um, but I think there'll be a lot of interest in Selangor, Penang and Negeri Sembilan. Um, but I also have to say that while there will be contestations there and BN will try and take yeah. uh, some of those seats, I think that eventually what it seems to be, what, what seems to be happening is that yeah. there seems to be a carving out of Malaysia as a peninsula where yeah. you have different belts and regions, mm -hmm. right? So you have yeah. a pH dominant West Coast and a PN dominant like North and East Coast of Peninsula. And mm. that could be enough to keep them at bay. Um, Penang and Negeri Sembilan, not so important. I do see that the competition will be really rife in a state like Selangor. Okay, so let's talk about Selangor. Um, yeah state that we are all living in right now, also the state that I have covered the most probably in my own research. Yeah. Um, BN didn't win a single parliamentary seat in Selangor this time. Yeah. Um, I, sorry? Sorry, so go ahead. Go yeah, ahead yeah, I mean, uh, so PN did, right? Yeah. PN took over the, the, the parliamentary seats that have been traditionally held by AMNO. Um, mm -hmm. You're talking about the smaller rural areas like Sungai Besar, Tanjung Kara. Mm -hmm. So yeah. PN took all these seats, PN slash PAS, right? So Besatu, Besatu or PAS uh, positions. And uh, this will give them a stronghold to also fight for the state seats um, within yeah. those belts, right, of Selangor. Yeah. So never mind the urban areas like Damansara. I mean, look at the majority that Gobin got um, yeah. or Subang, uh, it, it it will be it will be unfortunately delineated along ethnic lines once again. Yeah, which isn't healthy, but that's the reality of Malaysian politics today. Yeah, I almost forgot. That's why I I had to uh, sort of like <laughs> interrupt you a bit, okay? Because I didn't want to I do not want to forget this. Before I I forgot about Doctor Martin, okay? <laughs> because that uh, I assume that then uh, that well the people of Langkawi would actually vo uh, vote him in, okay? Yeah. One seat. Yeah. But uh, his performance was actually quite terrible, okay? Uh, right. Why do you think that the people of Langkawi felt that, look, enough is enough, we don't want you anymore, goodbye? Why do you think they were prepared to do that? Um, well, I, I think the history of fringe parties and breakaway parties in Malaysia has never really been successful, um, mm. even as far back as Semangat 46 under, you know, yeah, Kuli and, and any various breakaways. Yeah. The performance is always very poor. Uh, I mean, mm. one could argue that Bersatu is yeah. a breakaway from Amno as well, but uh, that's you know probably requires a different level of analysis. Um, but for party as small as Pejuang, probably with no coalition cooperation yeah. with other parties. I mean, GTA was not really a strong coalition to begin with. That's one, and I think second, it really did look like a northern sweep of Perikatan National, no matter which candidate it was, right? So yeah. it was Mahathir, it was Nurul Iza, um, this northern sweep that Perikatan National yeah. was able to establish, uh, quite astounding actually, and I think uh, a lot of articles will be written in the coming yeah. years, yeah, for that. Okay, before we end this program, um, in GE, uh, after the Sheraton move, okay, so the uh, seats had got to be given out uh, to pass and everybody. Uh, when, I, when I went through the list, you know that... Uh, in giving out these positions, sometimes prime ministers do not uh, think carefully. Um, twenty twenty three will be a tough year economically. Uh, we all know that uh, the IMF, the World Bank, has given up this warning. Uh, we have missed the boat so many times because of this election we did not attend APEC. Uh, deals were made between the the US and Indonesia. Indonesia did very well. We were not present, and that uh, in in back to the cabinet position. So they always think that, oh, environment is not important. We give it to somebody I mean, that uh, the dominant party do not want or give it to somebody else. Oh, tourism, not so important. Give it away. Uh, planting, uh, commodity is not so important. But the reality is that many of these are actually revenue earning ministries. So uh, what is your call that, uh, you know, we're going to have a bloated, we're going to, we can expect a bloated uh, government, okay? And then, but many, certain ministries are actually 
be very important. Uh, it should not be taken lightly, especially if it's going to be of revenue uh, earning. And then, of course, uh, in Putrajaya, uh, the uh, education uh, minister, I think he made this pledge rightly or wrongly. I would say it rightly or wrongly. I read that uh, his campaign included abolishing additional maths, okay? So I don't know whether it was real or fake news, but um, if you're the prime minister, and what would be the priority uh, ministries that you would want to uh, focus on? Okay, so um, number one, whatever government is formed, I really hope that the cabinet minister selected for the Ministry of Finance, for Ministry of International Trade and Industry, MITI, as well as Economic Affairs, which governs Economic Planning Unit. I mean, these three need to be strong, high-caliber individuals who know about the economy, right, who have that kind of economic background uh, or a policy background to be able to steer the country really forward. Um, you mentioned correctly, even things like commodity plantation, I mean, things yeah. like palm oil really contributes to our country's revenue. Um, I think that these are among some of the ministries that really need a strong caliber pe person or persons and uh, I think it's time to look at the list of MPs who have won um, within PNBN to see who are the ones that actually have those professional qualifications to meet the standards that uh, Malaysia facing an economic recession within you know, ASEAN, having ratified the CPTPP and the RCEP needs to have an understanding of all these international obligations and agreements that we've actually signed um, because the industry depends on it. Thank you, Dr. Fisher, for joining us. Uh, to all Malaysians who are following this program, thank you for taking part in the voting process and being uh, and to help with Malaysia. We will have to accept whatever results that uh, we have decided. Uh, as they say that uh, the leaders come with your choice and the options. You deserve what you get in a way. But uh, we believe that uh, and we hope that Malaysia will come out stronger of this. Thank you, Malaysians, for joining us. And good night. Thank you, Tricia. Good night. Bye. Thank you so much.